Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name's Carl and it's great to have you with us. This week we're looking ahead to the festival of Pentecost and the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But before we delve into that, if you've not done so already, you may find it helpful to download the sheet that accompanies this study. You can find the link for that just below the video in YouTube. On the sheet you will find the reading that we're going to be looking at, plenty of space for you to make your own comments and observations, some other passages that you might wish to look up, and the questions that we'll consider together later on. So without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from the Book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. The setting for today's passage is Jerusalem, and it begins in the upper room where the disciples had been staying. We learn in chapter 1 that there was about 120 people there all together, and they'd just chosen a replacement for Judas by the casting of lots. Matthias had been chosen to replace him as one of the twelve. That's what we learn in verses 15 to 26. And we know that the events described in today's passage come on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of the three pilgrim festivals in which men from all over were encouraged to go to Jerusalem and join in the celebrations and festivities and indeed, very often, whole families, whole households would, would go. It had much in common with our own harvest festival, did Pentecost, or the Festival of Weeks, and took place 50 days after Passover, where God's liberation of the people from oppression in Egypt had been remembered. By the time we get to Jesus' day, and certainly Luke's day, um, it was a major festival celebrating new beginnings and covenant renewal and fresh hope, it was a time of giving thanks to God for all that God had done. And this passage today is part of a section that runs from the beginning of chapter 2 to verse 4 of chapter 8, covering the experiences of the Christians in Jerusalem. And in particular, the section that begins with today's reading and runs to chapter 3, verse 26, documents firstly Pentecost and then the appeal that's made to all Israel to recognise the risen Jesus. So who have we got in this passage? Well, in many ways the most important figure is Peter. He was someone who, if you remember, had denied Jesus three times after Jesus' arrest, pretended he didn't even know Jesus in order to save his own bacon. And yet in today's passage, he is the one who stands up and gives this great apologetic speech, proclaiming the risen Jesus to all Jerusalem. We have the disciples, as I say, around 120 people gathered together in that upper room where they've been staying in Jerusalem and purposefully waiting for the coming of the Spirit, as we learn in verses 13 to 15 of chapter 1. And we also, as we find in this passage, have a very varied crowd. It's important to remember that there was a huge mixture of residents in Jerusalem from all over the place, as well as people who had travelled there for the festival, which, as I say, was one of the three where people from all around would flock into the city. So it was a swollen and diverse population. It's worth keeping in mind that the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are Volume 1 and Volume 2, respectively, of a two-part work. Written around 80 to 85 of the Common Era and to a mostly Gentile audience. This latter point about Luke's audience mainly being Gentiles is really important because there's a really strong focus here on the full inclusion of the Gentiles in the kingdom of God. So the word beginning from Jerusalem, going out to Israel and then to all nations. So that underlies so much of Luke's presentation of Pentecost. Verses 
There are some other passages that it's helpful to keep in mind. So, for example, we might turn to Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to 18, which concerned the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and the forming of God's covenant with the people of Israel. By Luke's day, that whole series of events had come very strongly to be associated with Pentecost. It was about covenant renewal. We learn in perhaps a, a text that might be obscure to many of us, Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, that Moses, in exasperation actually in a particular, that particular incident, called for the Spirit to be poured out on all people. At that point, I guess it meant the people of Israel alone, and arguably the prophet Joel picks up on that. But this is a text which finds its second, one might say, fulfilment in the events of Pentecost. And I'll say a bit more about that as we run through. Perhaps the most obvious and famous Old Testament text that we find here comes from the book of Joel. It comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to the first part of verse 32. Though there are different renderings of the verse numbers in the Greek and the Hebrew versions of uh, Joel, so different Bible translations may number these, these things differently. It's quoted by Peter and arguably it forms the key not just to this passage, but the whole of the book of Acts. And again, I'll say more about the significance of this quote from Joel as we go along. And finally, it may be worth looking at John chapter 20, and specifically verse 22, which show the, whole, the giving of the Holy Spirit being part of a resurrection appearance rather than a separate post-ascension event, as Luke narrates it for us. So it's a different presentation. To keep in mind. So we've got a lot of background there. Let's dive now into the detail of the passage. In verse 2, the Greek word pneuma means both wind and spirit, and it thus echoes that double meaning of ruach from the Hebrew. And that spirit was present on Mount Sinai when Moses was receiving the law. And if you recall from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 21 to 22, at Jesus' baptism. So it's the same spirit that has triggered immensely important events, kick-starting new phases, if you will, in the life of the people of Israel. Indeed, the life of the people of the whole world. And the imagery of tongues of fire that we find in verse 3, again, echoes the imagery of Sinai. You see that particularly in Exodus 19. And that's where the, a lot of the argument comes from, that Pentecost had come to be associated with covenant renewal by the time of Jesus, and particularly by the time that Luke was, was writing. There are other interpretations sometimes given to these signs and wonders, as it were, these dramatic outpourings. Um, and not all scholars would agree with the view that this is about covenant renewal, but it fits most consistently with the evidence that we do have. And in particular, there are similar references in the Qumran community in their writings to renewal of their own vows and, and covenant. We're told that the Disciples that were there, the 120 people, suddenly were able to communicate in a wide range of languages, presumably not just the ones they actually knew about and were consciously able to speak. And this gift of communicating in a variety of different tongues is called xenolalia, rather than the glossolalia, which we um, sometimes think of when we talk about speaking in, in tongues, and talking about a kind of special ecstatic language that then needs interpretation. This was something slightly different that we find in verse 4. And as we find in verse 5, we have a pattern that we'll see repeated in the book of Acts, in that Jews are addressed first um, and then others are addressed. And as I say earlier, the city had many residents who'd come from different places, not just visitors. Hence, something of the range of languages that we see mentioned in verses 6 to 11, we have that great list. Um, 
I remember once hearing someone accidentally, instead of saying Cretans and Arabs, said Cretans and Arabs, which uh, does make me giggle. But it's, it's the point that there's this really diverse range of people present to hear this. So it's a really remarkable event that we have, these disciples being able to speak all of these wondrous different languages. And the list that we have in verses 6 to 11 moves from east to west. So there's a movement out, really, kind of from Jerusalem outwards to, to more Gentile nations, and how they're listed. We know in verses 12 and 13 that there was, as so often when the gospel is proclaimed, a mixed reaction. Some people were amazed, they've kind of puzzled. Others were outright cynical and sceptical and said, well, they've, they've been drinking, haven't they? This is, this is drunken behaviour. Peter stands up and makes the first of four apologetic speeches that he will make in the book of Acts in response to these allegations. And he's very much saying, no, these are not drunk folks, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is God's work. And so the first thing he does is to quote from the book of Joel. As I say, it comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to the first part of verse 32. And it's used to explain what's going on. Now, if we go back for a moment into Luke's gospel, we remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus stands up in the synagogue, he's presented with the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he quotes from it about setting the oppressed free and giving sight to the blind and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. And then people turn on him. Now, in verses 18 to 19 of chapter 4, where Luke is quoting from Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah 61, verses 1 to the first part of verse 2. But Luke makes some subtle but important alterations to the Greek text of Isaiah 61. And something very similar seems to be going on here in Luke's usage of Joel. That quotation from, Je from by Jesus of Isaiah is foundational for the whole of Luke's gospel. I've sometimes referred to it as Jesus' manifesto. He's setting out his storm. This is what I am about. And arguably, this quotation from the book of Joel is similarly programmatic for the whole of the book of Acts, not just Acts 2. So it's a really significant point. Now, there's some debate over whether Peter, the historical figure Peter, actually said precisely these words, whether it was completely Luke's invention or it was kind of a bit of both, with Luke casting things in terms of the kind of language and style that the apostles might have used. I think the strongest case is that this is somewhere kind of in the middle, but primarily Luke's invention. And the reason for that is the so close alignment between what's quoted and the Greek text of Isaiah, the text from the Septuagint, which is sometimes abbreviated the LXX. Um, there are, as I say, though, significant alterations there, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But I think it does fit with the kind of style of, of what Peter would have would have said. Now, if we want to get to the bottom of how Luke precisely uses this quotation from Joel, it is complicated by the fact that there are two textual traditions for the book of Acts. And it's the only New Testament book where we have two rival textual traditions. But it's likely that what went on in the interaction of these two traditions was that the minority were kind of assimilated to look more like the majority. And so the argument is that despite having these two textual traditions, we can still meaningfully get a sense of how Luke plays with this quotation from Joel. If you want to find out more about that, uh, the great C.K. Barrett's commentary on the book of Acts is one of the best places to go in terms of finding a detailed explanation of the evolution of these textual traditions and how they relate to one another. Joel is a fascinating book to have quoted from. 
It's been described as the problem child of Old Testament exegesis. And the reason for that is that there is just no consensus about its authorship or its dating or its interpretation among biblical scholars. Joel was one of the 12 minor prophets. And this particular nugget that Luke quotes or has Peter quote, um, seems to anticipate the fulfillment of Numbers 11 verse 29. Moses calling for the spirit to be poured out on all people. But I think there's a very clear argument that Joel envisages, envisages this as just being about Israel. And indeed, the latter part of verse 32 in Joel chapter 2 um, draws our attention to uh, uh, the, the focus on Jerusalem and Zion. And elsewhere, the Gentiles really do, do not come out well at all in Joel. So... It's arguably why um, Luke doesn't include that stuff about Jerusalem and Zion in his quotation from, from Joel. And I think Luke's overriding goal here is to point to the full inclusion of the Gentiles. And I think that's why. And it begs a fascinating question about whether a prophecy can be fulfilled more than once. Um, whether there was a fulfillment in the time of Joel, whenever that was, um, but also perhaps the fullest fulfilment, if I can put it like that, in the book of Acts. Now, we see that Luke had um, some kind of inspiration, I think, from the Qumran community and their imaginative use of texts of the Old Testament in, in, in new ways to speak to a contemporary situation. And it seems that that's what Luke has done here. He's taken this text of Joel and he's used it to speak into this amazing new revelation brought about by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ro Williams describes the resurrection as being like a second big bang, an explosion of creative energy into the universe. And it's like through the Holy Spirit, this has been kind of poured into the hearts of people and is going to change the world forever. So if that's the framework that you're thinking in, it doesn't surprise me that Luke then wanted to take this text of Joel and paint it onto a much bigger canvas than the prophet themselves may have ever imagined. It's useful, although it's a bit technical, to look at some of the alterations that Luke makes to the original text of Joel. So in Acts 2 verse 17, the afterwards of Joel 2.28 is then rendered in the last days. So there's a movement there in emphasis. And it's quite possible that Luke understood himself as living in these last days, in this time that's now opened up for the Gentiles to be able to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. We find in verse 21 of Acts 2. Now, this particular phraseology in the last days is only found in one other place in the Greek version of Isaiah. And that's in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 which is a passage that basically offers a great vision of peace. Um, it goes on to talk about beating swords into plowshares, for example. And it may be that Luke is wanting to bring some of the context of that into the frame here in Acts with this kind of echo of Isaiah. And certainly um, he appears to be say, leaving some time open for this to happen with his deliberate alteration of verse 17. In verses 19 to 20, there are additions of words, depending on your translation, of uh, things being about wonders above and signs below, pointing to prophetic and eschatological dimensions of this emphasis on the inclusion of the Gentiles, respectively. So we have um, the wonders and the signs relating to the life, death and resurrection of Jesus and what God is going to do in the fullness of time at the end of days. And we're in this kind of last period, the now and not yet, of the breaking in of the kingdom of God in all of its fullness. And so there's time, therefore, as we see in verse 21, to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved before Christ's return. That gets us to look ahead to Acts 3 verses 20 to 21. And these words around signs and wonders 
when they do appear um, in the Hebrew scriptures, they always seem to point to liberation by God. And we've talked about Pentecost as being about new beginnings, about covenant renewal, about fresh hope. So there's a tying in with that. And it's like the church is kind of picking up the baton of this almost, being um, about renewal and wholeness. And in verse 21, as I say, Luke drops off the last little bit of his quotation from Joel, um, which I think is very much about broadening out this vision um, of Numbers 11 from just applying to Israel to applying to all people, the spirit being able to be poured out on all. Now, I think Luke quite definitely goes beyond where the historical figure of Peter would have been at that time in his thinking. I think he would have thought of the spirit as being poured out on Israel alone. But Peter is one who will go on in these first eight chapters of the book of Acts to have his understanding of the fullness of God's kingdom really challenged in a profound way. And he will go on in this section to speak of Jesus as one who performed immense signs and wonders, but who was crucified by the religious authorities before being raised from the dead. And it's this resurrection which is the catalyst for this new stuff that the early church really had to wrestle with. And indeed, if you look at the contents of so many of Paul's letters, they relate to a lot of these struggles about how can Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians with such different backgrounds live together authentically. So we're already seeing here some of the things that will become a struggle in the life of the early church. But we do learn in verse 41 of chapter 2 of Acts that there were 3,000 people added to the number of the disciples on that day, which is a quite remarkable statistic. So there's a lot of depth here. There's a lot of Old Testament background going on and a lot of contested scholarship, it's fair to say, around Acts chapter 2. Some from a more Pentecostal tradition, like Marshall, for example, have argued that this is primarily pointing to signs and supernatural wonders that ought to be present in the authentic church today. Others have argued that this is a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Um, and there are arguments for both of those points of view. But for me, this sense of it being about covenant renewal, the birth of the church and the catalyst of something new as all nations come to be able to be included in the kingdom of God makes most sense of what we find um, in the overall picture that Luke seems to be trying to paint in his gospel and the book of Acts. And it's worth noting further that in Joel chapter 3, we actually have a vision of war. We talk um, plowshares being beat into swords. And so you can see perhaps this echo of Isaiah chapter 2 in, in Luke wanting to set up a deliberate contrast to that. And that for me is one of the strongest arguments that primarily, as we've so often in Luke's writings, this text is about inclusion.